As a young boy, I often found myself drawn to things that were considered unconventional by society's standards. It was a sunny afternoon when my curiosity led me to a hidden corner of our attic, where I stumbled upon a box filled with an array of vibrant, flowing dresses. They were my mother's old gowns from her youth, and the sight of them intrigued me like nothing else ever had. Intrigued, I decided to sneak one of the dresses down to my room, putting it on in secret. The fabric cascaded around me, making me feel like a princess from a storybook. It was an odd yet exhilarating sensation, and I couldn't help but twirl in front of the mirror. As I spun and giggled, the door creaked open, revealing my mother's surprised expression. She stood there, her gaze alternating between the dress-clad me and her cherished dresses strewn across the room. She didn't utter a word but instead approached with a gentle smile and knelt beside me. Her warm hand rested on my shoulder, and she said, You look beautiful, my love. My heart skipped a beat, and I braced myself for a reprimand, but instead, my mother surprised me. She began to teach me how to behave like a girl, as she had once been taught. She showed me how to sit gracefully, how to walk with elegance, and even how to curtsy. As we spent hours together, her lessons on femininity felt like a special secret we shared, a bond that only we understood. My mother's guidance wasn't about conforming to societal norms or expectations. It was about allowing me to explore my own identity, to express myself freely, and to embrace the aspects of my personality that society often dismissed as unconventional. In her eyes, there was no right or wrong way to be, only the way that made me feel true to myself. As I continued to explore my, girly, side with my mother's support, she decided to make our little lessons into a fun game. She introduced me to a whole new world of what she called, girl behavior. It was like a treasure hunt for me, discovering the secrets of how to be feminine in the most delightful ways. We'd have our girl days when my father was away at work. On those special days, I'd dress up in one of her elegant dresses, usually one of the simpler ones so I could move comfortably, and we'd engage in various activities to test my girl behavior. One of my favorite lessons was about posture and grace. My mother would set up a tea party for us in the living room, complete with delicate teacups, pastries, and a dainty tablecloth. I'd sit across from her, sipping from the tiny porcelain cup, practicing holding it with my pinky raised, just like she did. She'd offer pointers on how to sit up straight and cross my ankles, making sure I looked as refined as possible. We'd also experiment with different hairstyles, braiding my hair into intricate patterns, and applying a touch of makeup, nothing too extreme, just a little blush and lip gloss to enhance my natural features. My mother's hands were gentle and skilled, and she taught me that makeup was an art, not a mask. In the garden, she'd teach me about flower arrangements, showing me how to pick the prettiest blossoms and arrange them in a vase with care. I loved how she made everything seem like magic, and I felt like a fairy in her enchanting world. But the most cherished lesson of all was how to express emotions. My mother encouraged me to be open and honest about my feelings, without the pressure to conform to stereotypical notions of masculinity. She told me that vulnerability was a strength and that it was okay to show empathy, kindness, and love, just like girls do. Over the years, I became more comfortable with my, girly, side. While I was still the same boy who enjoyed sports and other typically, boyish, activities, I had also found a balance. I realized that there was no need to limit myself or hide who I truly was. My mother's lessons in girl behavior had given me a deeper understanding of empathy, grace, and self-expression. I was grateful for the love and acceptance she had shown me throughout this journey, teaching me that it was okay to be a girly boy, a boy who could embrace all aspects of his personality without fear of judgment or ridicule. As I entered my teenage years, my fascination with femininity remained, but it also began to raise questions and concerns within my family. My mother, despite her loving and accepting nature, worried about the challenges I might face in the outside world due to my unconventional interests. That's when she decided to send me to live with my aunt, who had a reputation for being a bit more traditional and strict. My aunt welcomed me into her home, and her approach to my, girly, tendencies was different from my mother's. 
She believed that to help me fit into societal norms, I needed to embrace a more submissive and obedient form of femininity. At my aunt's house, there were no longer boys' clothes in my wardrobe. Instead, it was filled with dresses, skirts, and blouses. I found myself wearing feminine attire not just occasionally, as I had done with my mother, but all the time. My aunt insisted that it was the only way I would truly understand what it meant to be a girl. She introduced me to a strict regimen of lessons and rules. She taught me to walk with smaller steps, maintain a soft-spoken voice, and adopt a more demure posture. I was required to practice curtsies regularly and maintain a serene, ladylike demeanor at all times. My aunt's lessons went beyond the physical aspects of femininity, she also emphasized the importance of being agreeable, accommodating, and always putting others' needs before my own. She believed that these traits were essential for a well-behaved girl. Living with my aunt challenged me in ways I had never experienced before. Her approach was more rigid and demanding, and it often felt like I was constantly being tested. The pressure to conform to her idea of femininity weighed on me, and it became a struggle to maintain my sense of self amidst her expectations. Over time, I began to see the stark contrast between my mother's nurturing, accepting approach and my aunt's strict, disciplinary one. I felt torn between these two worlds, torn between being my authentic self and becoming a more submissive and obedient version of a girl. As I lived with my aunt, my world became increasingly focused on conforming to her strict ideals of femininity. I practiced walking gracefully, perfected my curtsies, and learned how to be obedient and submissive in her eyes. It was a challenging period, but my aunt was unwavering in her belief that this was the path to my success in the world. One day, my aunt received a call from an old friend, Mr. Peterson. He had recently lost his wife and was struggling to manage his large estate on his own. My aunt saw an opportunity and offered my services as a live-in maid to Mr. Peterson, believing it would further immerse me in a feminine role and help me refine my abilities. Mr. Peterson accepted the offer, and I found myself living in a grand, old mansion as his maid. The transition was drastic, as I went from my aunt's strict tutelage to a new environment where I was expected to serve Mr. Peterson and maintain the house in a completely different manner. Mr. Peterson was a kind man, but the loss of his wife had left him deeply grieving. I became not only his maid but also a source of companionship and emotional support. He often shared stories of his late wife, and I listened attentively, trying to be the empathetic and nurturing person my aunt had taught me to be. The large estate demanded much of my attention. I cooked, cleaned, and managed the household chores with diligence. My attire now consisted of a traditional maid's uniform, complete with a frilly apron and a neat cap. The role I played had shifted from simply embracing femininity to becoming a servant, responsible for every aspect of the household's functioning. Over time, my life as Mr. Peterson's maid became routine, and I found a sense of purpose in my work. I wasn't just learning to be a girl anymore, I was becoming a valuable member of his household, a position I had never anticipated. As time passed, Mr. Peterson's grief over the loss of his wife showed no signs of abating. He was overwhelmed by loneliness, and his grand mansion felt emptier with each passing day. It was during one of our conversations in which he shared fond memories of his late wife that he made an unusual request. He asked if I would consider wearing some of his late wife's dresses. He explained that seeing me in her clothes brought him comfort, as it reminded him of happier times when his wife was still with him. Although I was hesitant at first, my empathy and desire to provide him solace ultimately led me to agree to his request. I began to don his late wife's dresses, each one a reminder of the woman he had cherished for so many years. It was a delicate and poignant process, as I carefully selected the garments and took great care in wearing them. In this act of dressing as his wife once had, I aimed to bring a semblance of her presence back into his life. Remarkably, as I wore those dresses, something began to change within Mr. Peterson. He appeared to find solace in the way I presented myself, as it felt like a connection to the love he had lost. His melancholy demeanor started to lift, and he became more engaged with life once again. 
We shared moments where he'd talk about his wife and the experiences they had together. These conversations allowed him to process his grief and find healing. I became not only his maid but also a confidant, a living connection to his past. As time passed, Mr. Peterson's connection with me deepened, and he began to call me by his late wife's name, Emily. It was as if he saw in me not just a helpful presence but a comforting reminder of the woman he had loved so dearly. One evening, while I was dressed in a radiant red sparkling gown that had once belonged to Emily, Mr. Peterson invited me to join him in the living room. Soft, romantic music played in the background, and he extended his hand to me. Without hesitation, I accepted his invitation to dance. As we swayed together on the ornate, polished wooden floor, it was a surreal moment. The gown shimmered as we moved, and I felt as though I had become a living embodiment of the love story that had once graced these very halls. Mr. Peterson held me tenderly, his eyes reflecting a mixture of joy and melancholy. He shared stories of his dances with his wife, recalling how they had danced under the grand chandelier, just as we were doing now. In that intimate dance, I felt a deep connection with Mr. Peterson, and it was as if the boundaries of gender and identity had faded away. Our shared grief and memories created a bridge between us that transcended conventional notions of self. The dance in that sparkling red gown was a poignant moment, a fusion of past and present, of grief and healing. It symbolized the complex nature of identity, love, and human connection. In that room, amidst the music and the memories, I realized that sometimes, we don't fit neatly into societal boxes, and that's perfectly okay. What truly matters is the compassion, understanding, and empathy we extend to one another on life's unique and unexpected journeys.